where, mm-hmm. where we'd love to start is just something sitting here today that you feel grateful for. Um, yeah, uh, I'm grateful for a lot. Um, it's a great question. I think, you know, I, I grew up in Hollywood, Northern Ireland, a little town with 12,000 people and to be sitting here in Jupiter, Florida, having lived in this place for, uh, 12 years now. And I mean, it is, it's not even a world away from where I grew up. This is like a galaxy away from where I grew up. So, um, I'm grateful for, I think I'm just grateful for the, what the, all the opportunities and all the things that golf has provided me with, um, golf, like it, it's been a, you know, it's been the, my parents and golf have been the constant in my life. And I think about, you know, they're so intertwined as well. And, you know, I'm grateful for their love and support and, and helping me get to this position that I'm in, but also I'm grateful to the game of golf that it's given me the opportunity to meet both of you guys, to go and see great places around the world and to, yeah. And to meet incredible people and, um, so, I mean, I think just all of that, I mean, the, the two things that come to my mind, I guess that was a, a long answer and a long way of saying that I'm incredibly grateful to my parents and I'm incredibly grateful for the game of golf. Yeah. Talk, it, talk about your parents, like wh- how, how they had an effect on you, because obviously parents have a huge effect on everybody, regardless of if it's good or bad, they transform you into what you are. Yeah. So. Yeah. So I, I would say I'm, um, I'm probably like, 70% or 80% my dad and yeah. 20 or 30% my mom. Um, so yeah, my, I wouldn't say my upbringing was like a normal upbringing. Um, both of my parents worked incredibly hard. We didn't have a lot. Uh, my dad, you know, regularly worked 90 to a hundred hour weeks. Uh, my mom worked night shifts in a factory. Um, so I, I didn't spend a ton of time like with both of my parents at the same time. I was either spending time with my dad or I was spending time with my mom. It was very rare that we would all get time together as a family. Um, so, but that was, that was my, that was my normal. That's, that's all I knew. Um, but I think because of that, and even though I didn't realize it at the time that I think instilled like a really hard work ethic in me, just seeing what, they sacrificed and and how hard they worked just to give me the opportunity to play golf and travel the world and try to chase my dream. So, um, yeah. And you know, the thing that I think about now, now that I'm in this position, you know, my dad is 60, my mom just, yeah, they're both 64. My dad will be 65 this year. And it's like, I, you know, the, you know, say the, 18 years that that I spent with them growing up you know hopefully they have more than 18 years left in their lives but you know I I really want to give them like the best you know last years of their life I think that's like really really important because yeah I can never repay them for what they've done for me but um you know if I can like you saw my dad at Seminole right and you know he like again you know a man that grew up playing golf at Hollywood golf club, a very average run of the mill golf course. It was a great place to grow up, but to then be a member at Seminole playing with all these people, um, and all these, all these members. And, you know, it's a, it's a completely different world, but you know, he sort of fit into that so seamlessly. And, um, and then my mom, again, she loves Florida. She loves the sunshine. She loves being outside. So to, to be able to, to give them, you know, hopefully what they want for the last few years of their life is, is really important to me. Yeah. I remember playing golf with your dad for the first time, I think in 2016 or 17 at the bears club. And we were playing in the the Friday men's game at like a noon tip game. Right. So you play all the way back and I get paired with your dad and I hadn't met him before. And he was, you know, incredibly kind. He's just honestly, how much you guys are alike is crazy. (laughs) But, but anyway, we're, we're playing, we're playing throughout the round. Everything's going well. We get to 13 and it's into the wind on 13, 14, 15, right? Playing all the way back. And your dad hits this three iron into 13 to like five feet, bird, go to 14, <laughs> back left pin, three iron, 
bird. <laughs> go to go to fifteen. He's got like two forty into the window, a back pin, hits three wood. Bird. <laughs> no way. And so we made yeah. you know, we were all laughing doing this and, and we called it. We're like, Well now we've got the McElroy stretch. You know, it's this thirteen <laughs> through fifteen. And so for years I I'd for, honestly forgotten about it until now, but when I'd play those holes I'd be like, Oh, you know, this is the McElroy stretch. I'd be like, Oh, what Rory do? You know? <laughs> No, no, yeah. no <laughs> this Jerry. is Jer. <laughs> three iron, three iron, three wood, just bird, bird, bird. Yeah, but I think that, you know, he's always loved the game of golf, and um, that's that's definitely where I got the love from. And, um, yeah, he, again, I, I think, you know, you know his work ethic and, and when I grew up and, and seeing how hard he worked combined with, his love for the game of golf, I think, you know, those two things combined for me is – you know, a lot of the reason why I've, I've had success in the game. Yeah. How has like your love for the game of golf changed over the years? I mean, as you're, when you're a kid, you know, we just, we love going to the golf course, you want to play from night, you know, morning to, to yeah. night, but how has your love changed over the years for it? It, it ebbs and flows. I think, <laughs> uh, when you turn pro, I think, um, I think uh, again, the, you know, as I said, the, the two constants in my life, um, for the last 35 years have been golf and my parents. So, um, I think I, I would say my love for golf is unconditional. Like, Mm -hmm. I don't think I have to play well, or I have to do things in the game to love the game of golf because of what it has provided me. You know, I'll always love the game, but I like the game way more when I play well. (laughs) (laughs) So, um, and I think that's the, you, you turn pro and I've, I've really tried hard over the last few years to play golf for fun again, Mm -hmm. because, you know, there was a period in in my career, I would say from like 2011 to probably like 2015. And it, it coincided with a really great time in my career, but the only time I, times I really played golf was competing. And that's, that's nice in a way, but it, I think it, I think I lost probably a little bit of my love for the game in that time period because I I probably didn't appreciate what what golf meant to me and my family and, and everything else that comes along with it and my friends. So I really tried over these last few years to play a lot more golf for fun and it's definitely like rekindled that 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 joy in it for me. That's cool. I've kind of been in the same place. Yeah. Like I yeah. Mean, obviously it, quite a different level but no um, but like it's it, it's it is a thing right it, it is such a thing like and it's funny when we were talking about questions earlier of like what to talk about and like I feel like a, a question that's reiterated a lot to athletes in general is like when you are playing your best and you're in the zone like what do you feel but like I feel everyone answers the same question of like it just it's just happening yeah, you feel because, nothing. yeah because it's mm it's not like a place where you're like, okay, if I do this, 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 and this, I'm going to get there. It's like, it just happens because you put in the work because you've believe in yourself because you know, indefinitely. Um, I don't know. Like, do you have anything to add? I would say, yeah, I, it's very hard. Like I tried, there's a really good book, um, called flow Mm. that Mm, came out in like, I don't know, early nineties, maybe. And it's someone trying to explain what we're trying to explain here, like being in the zone of that flow state. Mm -hmm. And even I think he has a hard time really (laughs) explaining what it is. And I've, I've, I struggled my way through that book because like it it gets too. I just think it's something that, yeah, you can't, you you know, when you, you, you know, when you're in it, because you know the feeling, but you never know how to rekindle it. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's like a, like I, I can remember the times where I've been in that zone or in that flow, but as you said, it's not like a, it's not just a journey or a checking of boxes of, okay, well, if I do this, 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 then I'll end up in that state. It's like, yeah. no, it, it's a, it's a perfect combination of a ton of different things that are, and I think the the other thing is you can't get in the flow consciously. You have to get in the flow subconsciously. Exactly. So how do we mm. tap into our subconscious? Mm-hmm. And that's a very difficult thing to do. Mm. People understand the conscious brain very well, but not a lot of people understand the subconscious brain very well. Yeah. Speaking of that, there's, there's this one time I'll never forget when I was playing 
in college. And it's happened many other times, but I was playing in Puerto Rico at the college event there for Oklahoma State. And I was playing bad. I was like four over on the front. And my coach, Mike McGraw, was with me at the time, walking with us. And he's like, usually the coach decides to walk with one player for the tournament. They can't really caddy for them, but just to like help out or watch and evaluate. And he left me after nine. He's like, maybe you just do your own thing. And I'll go help someone else. Like, oh, it's lying like shit. <laughs> and so I think I shot like eight under on the back. And I came to the last hole and I had like a 60 footer for birdie. And I'm like, coach comes over and he's like, how are you doing? Any better? I was like, yeah, actually I'm playing a lot better on this side. And I'm like, watch this. I'm going to make this. He's like, all right, let's see. So I make it. And I just, it was just this ultimate knowing that that was the only outcome. Yeah. Has there been times like that for you? And can you explain that? Have you studied the mind in a way to explain how that happens? So... I've had that feeling numerous times in my career where it's, you, you know, I'm like, I, I know this is what's going to happen. I know this is going to go in. I know I'm going to hit a great shot. And then you try to figure out, and even, even in practice sessions, I'll be with my, you know, I'll be struggling with my swing and then I'll hit one and it's like, yes, I've got it. Mm -hmm. But I would turn around to my coach, Michael, and be like, why did I know I was going to hit a good shot there? Like I just knew. So it's, it's, it's a, it's a feeling, it's a sense, it's a, but again, I think it's the, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of what we do on the golf course that is subconscious. So like, yeah, have I delved in hypnosis and tried to like tap into my subconscious brain? Yes, I have. I've, I've tried to do all these things because everyone is so good out there and how can you get that little edge on mm -hmm. people? So, and you know, I've, I've won way more golf tournaments with my mind than I have with my physical ability. Yep. And, you know, I think that's why Tiger is probably, and Jack are probably the, the two best ever is because their minds were just so much better than everyone else's. And yeah, it's a, it's, it's, you don't, it's hard. You don't want to be evaluating your thoughts while you're going either, because yeah. that's not a, that's not a good thing. But I think, you know, I haven't, I don't know the answer to why we, why you step over a 60 footer and you know, you're going to hold it and, the, and, the, and it goes in. But I just know that whenever it does happen, it's a really cool feeling. It's an amazing, <laughs> amazing feeling. Yeah. yeah. It's crazy, man. Because like, you know, you study, that the body is electrical and we have an, an aura or there's a energy field around us. And yeah. I feel like, like the answer that I kind of go towards is that your positivity, if you will, your, your space that you can get into when those things do happen, it gives you a higher percentage that it's going to happen. But as I said earlier, like, we don't believe there is another outcome. So it's like, how do we tap into the universe? How do we tap into yeah. whatever the law of attraction? Yeah. Um, and think about how many variables right. on a 60 foot putt. Right. Mm -hmm. So many Spike variables. Spike marks, wind. Yeah. Like anything. The way the cup is cut. Yeah. <clears throat> so it's wild. Yeah. Yeah. And reaching that, that flow state that you talk about, it's, I'm sure there's places that you felt it outside of the game of golf too. Yeah. You know, like, I, I mean, we talked a lot about, you know, meditation and, you know, different areas yeah. of your life that you can try to get into flow states for me. Well, for each of us, we're, you know, you're a pilot. I'm learning, you know, learning how to fly right now, uh, surfing. I mean, there's all these different things that when you're in the moment, you're reaching that flow state. But yeah. is there other things that you do outside of the game of golf that always bring you into that flow state? Yeah, there are certain like, um, yeah, like so juggling. Juggling is one of the best things to mm -hmm. get into a flow state because... You're not, so it's, it's all like from things that I've been told, it's all to do with the gray matter in your brain and juggling is one of those things where you, you sort of have to concentrate on it, but you sort of don't. So I could be here mm -hmm. with three balls and look you in the eyes and juggle, but, and keep a conversation. It's a bit like driving, yeah. you know, you can be talking to someone Correct. on the phone in the car and you'll be constant, you know, your conscious brain is talking to that person yeah. subconsciously you're just going where you need to go and mm -hmm. how many times have you ended up 
at your destination and being like, I forgot how I got here almost (laughs) when you're talking to someone in the car. So, um, again, it's that, I think like, like psychology is very much like conscious thought, conscious mind. Um, but then you've got like neurology and like dabbled in like NLP, neuro linguistic programming. Mm -hmm. And that's all very much subconscious based. So (laughs) sort of trying to decipher between the two and how do you, because very, you know, the, the stories we tell ourselves too. So the conscious brain can very much affect subconsciously what's going on for with, sure. without our, I guess, without our knowledge of it even. Yeah. <laughs> what, um, why did you start juggling is, was one of your trainers that did yeah. one of your trainers? Yeah. One of my, tra- one of my trainers said, you know, <laughs> juggling is a really good thing for your mind. And then I've, I've went from juggling to, I have these, um, I've got these like eight sided balls Mm -hmm. so like i'll I'll have two and i'll i'll uh i'll throw them on the on the floor and you never know where they're going to go so it's just like reaction and and you're sort of trying to you're trying to look at a spot on the floor and then you're trying to you're trying to see where they go in your peripheral vision Mm -hmm. rather than actually looking for them Mm -hmm. so it's just a a way of again it's trying to get into one of those flow states do you do them both at the same time yeah and there's yeah yeah which is great you know what are those called the cue balls cue balls yeah i want to get those yeah they're like green and yellow i love little things yeah. like that yeah um who's your trainer that it was it specific to fitness or mental? uh a little bit of both mm-hmm. um so i work with a guy named ro sharma who is absolutely amazing he's done work with navy seals he's done work um, with other athletes and uh he is yeah he's I, i've worked with him since 2018 Mm. And, you know, I've gotten faster, I've gotten stronger, I've not been injured. That's you know, key, it's, yeah. yeah, that's <laughs> like the key. Yeah. Um, and I think I've become more resilient in my body and in my mind. And not, you know, I don't necessarily work with through once the mental stuff, but I, you know, I think he, he understands enough of it to, to throw things in that he think will help me. Where, yeah. where's the inspiration come for you? I mean, is it this curiosity is more of a human to learn these new things or is it always come back to golf and that you're trying to get better in the game of golf or is it more at the human level that you're just trying to improve as a person or your curiosities yeah so i i think it's on a human level for me yeah, more that's so what than i'm reading as you're talking about yeah this. i um i wasn't a great student um so i feel like i missed out like i didn't you know i i didn't even finish high school didn't go to college didn't care about school that much. And as I've gotten older, I think it's a, it's an itch that I never scratch basically. So I think that's really what has turned me into this sort of curious person that wants to learn about different things. And, Mm. um, and I think as well, there's certain, uh, I guess, passions that I have, whether it be health wellness and sort of more of the holistic side of that and the seeing you know honestly what a terrible job the whole medical industry does in terms of um illnesses and autoimmunity and all sorts of stuff so um like that to me is something that is just a a passion i like learning and i love listening to podcasts and i probably listen to too much of them but um (laughs) but it's something that I, that I'm passionate about and I want to, I want to learn about. So yeah, it's definitely at a more human level rather than a golf level. I yeah. Guess. Sort of, I, you know, I think I could probably not practice as much as I do and still be okay and get by at golf. So it's just more, yeah. Like you still, you still want to make sure you do the adequate amount and make sure you're doing the right things. But, um, yeah, I guess I just want to try to be a more well-rounded. It's yeah. fun to learn about your passions, though. It's fun to learn about yeah. things that you actually want to learn about. Like the, the first time I ever felt that was in college, and I was a, a business economics major, which was just because it had the most electives, <laughs> basically, <laughs> so I could play more golf. Yeah. Um, but I took uh, flight uh, ground school because yeah. Oklahoma State had a, their own airport there. Yeah. And once I started that, I was like, oh, damn, all right, I actually want to study this now. And I know what you mean. Like, it's it's fun to take your mind off your job 
golf yeah. Yeah. and and learn other things and yeah um what are what are some of your hobbies other than podcasts or <laughs> um, so i've actually um so over and i think it's it's probably because i've been around golf and because golf attracts like a lot of business people but i've um i started a basically an investment vehicle slash company back in 2019 mm. um that i've sort of got well, I've got very passionate about and um, invested in like 22 or 23 different companies oh, really? across all sorts of, there's been some, um, so like health and wellness, mm -hmm. uh, there's been some sports stuff, there's been um, like just other companies that have sort of, um, sort of come along and I've had the opportunity to invest in and um, that's become a, a pretty big passion of mine um and it actually it actually takes up you know quite a quite a bit of time just mm. with everything that um especially so like we bought into a formula one team last year oh, alpine sweet. um and there's some opportunities coming down the line to maybe get into some other sports and um and that's something that i that i am passionate about and i've invested in some things in golf as well and trying to as you both know golf is such a traditional um you know, and, and I think can be quite antiquated in some ways. So I've invested in some things to try to bring golf into the 21st century yeah. and sort of use technology to get it there. So, um, so yeah, there's things that I've done that I've, I'm pretty passionate about and think that I can actually make a difference in, in some way. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's, that's been, that takes up quite a bit of my time. Um, so like looking to invest in certain things and things that are fun and trying to invest with, um, people and groups that I can learn from as well. Again, mm -hmm. it's, it's almost like a, it's, a, it's another way to get an education and exactly. hopefully get paid for it as well in some way. <laughs> yeah. And grow with it too. Yeah. And, like, grow, and grow with it too. That's yeah. the most fun thing. And then know? sort of, okay, I'm not going to play professional golf my whole life, mm -hmm. you know, so what can I do that if I decide one day I want to hang it up and I want to go and pursue something else that I don't wake up and I'm like, oh no, what am I going to do? Mm -hmm. You know, I have something to, to step into straight away that I can, that I'm passionate about and that I still have, that I still feel like I can compete at a little bit. Right. I think that's, that's important for me as well. Yeah. The business world is cool. Like there's so many moving parts Yeah. and there's so much to learn. Uh, Jag is, um, someone who I've been learning from recently with business and, yeah. and looking into all the details of how to research a good investment yeah. um, and doing it with your friends or people who you've come across who can teach you a lot is, is really cool too. And I, I've invested in a few startups and it's just like yeah. cool to be a part of the beginning of something. Yeah. Well, I, I was actually going to draw back to a little bit of an earlier conversation when you're talking about mm -hmm. curiosities, right? And uh, you've been studying different things in the health and wellness space, but what is something that you're kind of just open-mindedly curious about right now that maybe you haven't experienced before, or you're just curious to learn more about today? Um, yeah, I think, you know, I, before we hopped on here and I talked about, oh, Costa Rica and, and <laughs> um, I think, yeah, I, you know, I, there's so, there's a ton of research out there about, um, mental health and well-being and using you know not using um pharmaceutical drugs but using um you know plant-based things and people are talking about whether it be mushrooms or ayahuasca or these things obviously that's something that i can't do as a as an athlete but i've just i've i've listened to and i've read enough um enough things to to just be really curious about it and to mm -hmm. you know because there is especially nowadays with social media and with um, the pressures that young people are feeling like mm. there is, there's like a mental health like epidemic in this, in this world, not just in this country, but in, in the world in general. Yeah. And just trying to figure out if there's any other ways or other um, modalities to help with that, I mm -hmm. think would be, would be, you know, a really interesting space to try to um, try to, you know, dive deeper into. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It is an interesting space yeah. for sure. Right. So what, um, what, um, 
why can't you do them because you're an athlete just for like drug testing i for think drug testing yeah i think so yeah i'm i look i haven't i like i've literally never taken anything in my life and i don't <laughs> plan to but mm. it's just more it's a it's a yeah it's a it's a curious it's a curiosity and and just more of a you know like you listen to like i listen to like say joe rogan or i listen mm -hmm. to andrew huberman or some of these guys and mm -hmm. um and it just seems to be something that's coming up more and more right and but yeah as an athlete like again i you know we get a finite amount of time that we can you know do what we want to do and i wouldn't want to take anything or do anything to jeopardize that in any way but mm -hmm. um it is definitely something the more that i've read and listened to it i've definitely got a little more curious about it <laughs> yeah it is it is interesting especially with more athletes doing it and now i think on golf digest posted the other day of like there is a couple tour players who have been microdosing on mushrooms yeah. that are obviously anonymous yeah um yeah and i know who they are and, and it's changed their game uh and their life but um it's in an interesting way because like using mushrooms uh to to help with your life and to be more connected it's like it's i used to think it was a shortcut to get to deeper knowledge or more education on yourself but it's kind of like a side door mm -hmm. to a place where you can get to on your own without any assistance yeah, yeah. like the human brain is i guess theoretically we only use 20 percent of our brain right yeah so mushrooms create new neural pathways to be able to access different parts and yeah. um different dimensions if you will yeah. if you believe in that um but we we have the power within us to do that and i'm curious if you use meditation at all to yeah to visualize or to go into different spaces of uh of yourself yeah so i would say um yeah meditation um breathing exercises um breathing specifically for me has really helped um i'm a terrible like mouth breather so like, <laughs> all i like what one of the things i think about on the golf course for example is keep your mouth closed like literally all the time keep your mouth closed that's great yeah just keep breathing through your nose yeah uh especially in like pressure situations mm -hmm. um that's so true. but breathing meditation yeah i mean i i i'm not as i i i've I meditate, I would say semi-regularly. Um, and it probably goes hand in hand with some of the breathing exercises and everything that I do. Mm -hmm. Um, nothing like what you've done, but you know, if you can carve out 10 to 15 minutes a day and change your life. Uh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and you can be consistent with it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't think anyone has done even even if it's some guided meditation on an app whatever it is yeah. I, no one's gonna you know sit and close their eyes for 10 minutes and do some breathing and and come out of it and say they feel worse right yeah right like it, it's it's not gonna hurt if anything it's gonna it's gonna be better yeah. so it's a it's a very simple way to just center yourself and because the like you think about the world that we live in nowadays compared to the world a hundred years ago and all the stuff that's around us, whether it's artificial lights, whether it's EMFs from all the stuff that we're, that's our phones or the, you know, things that we're wearing or mm. whatever it is. There's so many things around us that um, if, if we can just take a few minutes a day to get away from all of that, mm. like that has to be a good thing. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's so important. Like taking your shoes off. Yeah. Grinding. Yeah. Yeah. Grounding, yeah. It's very important. Is there any type of meditations that have titles that you use or p coaches that you've yeah, followed? Yeah. Um, so to me, so I, I use I use this app that um, it basically uses AI to train. Basically, it figures out what your what your ideal breathing rate is mm -hmm. so whether that's 5.5 breaths a minute or whether that's 6.2 breaths a minute and then okay. i use that as a guide in terms of some of the breathing exercises that i use um i think it's called resonant resonant breathing mm -hmm. um but apart from that no i mean whether it's just you know sitting there and you know 
going back through your day or visualizing good things that are going to happen to you or manifesting some things, whatever that is. I, mm -hmm. I, you know, I, but it's a, I would say it's a random assortment of a, a few of them. Yeah. It's, I mean, really like, as you said, just sitting with your eyes closed and giving yourself that time for self-reflection or yeah. like just calmness. Um, learning to, but, learning to be bored. Yeah. Like no one's bored anymore because there's always something there to take your attention <laughs> away. Point. You know, mm -hmm. Oh, my phone's here or the TV or whatever it is mm -hmm. like just learning to be learning to be like idle for a little bit. Yeah, exactly. Thing. Let the body rest. Yeah. Yeah. We talk about, you know, mental health in this conversation and, you know, you've obviously put yourself out there a lot over the last couple of years throughout all the changes in the game of golf. And, you know, as a golf fan and somebody that's passionate about the PGA tour, you know, I think you've done an incredible job being a spokesman and leader to the PGA tour. Um, but how would you rank your mental health through this project and, and where you sit today? Yeah, I, I'd say, um, my mental health was probably challenged quite a bit over the last couple of years. Uh, I've always prided myself on being quite a sort of resilient person. Mm -hmm. So, but yeah, I think it takes a certain, um, you know, it takes, I think if I had have been, I, I think I was much more thin skinned earlier in my career. And I think I've learned to, to sort of get a little bit tougher in that way. And huh. I, if I wasn't thick skinned, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have put myself out there. I wouldn't have been as outspoken as I was. Cause I just wouldn't have wanted to handle everything that came my way. Hmm. So, but that's the, you know, it's, you know, someone said to me, it's, it's, you know, a lot of the times or most of the time it's, it's, it's the hard thing to do the right thing, you know? Hmm. And that's my, you know, that's the way my parents raised me, I think. And that's the way I try to live my life is, you know, yeah, you want to do the right thing, but most of the time, the right thing is also the hard thing. Mm. Yeah. And uncomfortable sometimes because you know that there's going to be judgment or yeah. like, uh, but obviously, as you said, learning to have tough, thick skin, is there anything that was like transformative that was there a point in time where you're like, okay, I just have to have a, a guard up and know how to handle myself. I don't think it's really a guard up. I think it was a realization mm. that, um, as much as you want to, or as much as you try to have everyone in this world, like you, <laughs> it's not going to happen. Yeah. It's completely impossible. Right. So I think once I realized that and realized that not anyone, not everyone's going to like me anyway, I think I became much more comfortable with who I was as a person. And then mm -hmm. I think when you get to that level of comfort within yourself, you can be a little more outspoken and you can say things that piss people off. But at the end of the day, as long as you have the love from the people that are closest to you, mm -hmm. it doesn't really matter what anyone sells, says. And, and that's sort of the, that's the approach that I have taken to the last two years. And has it hurt some relationships along the way. Absolutely. But, um, you know, time is a great healer and, you know, I was speaking up for what I believed in and, um, I would, I would do the same thing all over again. For sure. Yeah. Speaking your truth is something that has been so transformative for me. Like yeah. learning, learning who you are is the hardest thing in the world Yeah. because especially today with kids growing up with Instagram and Facebook and seeing everyone in their perfect lives and their perfect snapshot is difficult to, to keep up with. Yeah. Um, so you, you said it perfectly of like finding out who you truly are and, and allowing yourself to speak out, um, about the things that you truly believe in. And Jag and I talk about this all the time. It's like when we're, when we're changing, which is inevitable through life, it's like a roller coaster. Yeah. Like you're going to have to go through the hard transitions with your friends as well. Yeah. Um, and what's been what's been cool to see is that like a lot of the people around me are kind of feel like they're going through the same thing yeah. sounds like mm -hmm. you are like finding ourselves finding the ability to speak up and and say what you truly believe in and, yeah. and i think it's a really cool shift that's happening right now yeah and i think that yeah that is 
that that that's like I think that's the like that's it right like yeah. that that is it with the human condition it is mm-hmm. figuring out who we are what our purpose is and surrounding ourselves with the right people and moving forward yeah because ultimately if you are your best self yeah then you can be allow everyone else to be their best exactly around you yeah. therefore the the cumulative will grow yeah in a better way as well and it's a perpetual cycle then yeah right exactly yeah I'm, like i remember when i was younger and i was getting into playing competitive golf and this became my total focus uh, i remember going through my first real struggle in the game of golf and i was around 19 years old or so i mean i had struggles and bad tournaments in the past but this was like my first long stint of like really having a hard time <laughs> and what I found was when I played bad, I just felt terrible as a person because I had my identity so wrapped yeah. around being a golfer, right? Mm-hmm. And I think this is very common in, you know, in when you're young and an athlete and something is your identities around your, your thing, your sport, right? Um, how has purpose changed for you in your life? If, if golf was maybe, you know, early on your number one focus, it still could be, is it, what has your purpose changed over time? Yeah. So I would say, um, Yeah, I, I probably, um, it took me a while to separate my score from my feelings about myself. Mm. I shot 65. I felt like I felt great. I felt really good about myself. I shoot 75 and I feel Mm. really shitty. Um, and it, it, it took me a while. It probably, it probably took me a good I was going to say like decade into my professional career to get to that point where I could disassociate, like just cause you shot a good score doesn't make you the greatest person on earth. <laughs> and just cause you shot yeah. a bad score doesn't make you a piece of shit. Right. <laughs> so, um, it, it took me a while to get to that point. I'm, you know, it probably was just right before COVID 2018, 2019, when mm. I, I sort of figured it out. I was like, okay, this is, and it, you know, it, it takes a lot of self-reflection and it takes a lot of, it, it also takes, it also takes having a little more balance in your life too. Hmm. So if golf is absolutely everything to you and that's, that is what your whole identity is wrapped up in, yeah. then yeah, I think it's very normal to feel that way, whether you have a good day or a bad day, but then having other things that sort of make you a more well-rounded person, whether it be relationships, family, um, other interests outside of golf, whether it be trying to learn new things or, um, you know, yeah, hobbies, like whether it be going to the gym or getting on the bike or flying, whatever it is that, you know, what's that juggling, juggling. whatever it is, <laughs> haven't started with knives yet. That's the next, that's the next thing. And but fire. yeah, yeah. So I think, yeah. And, and I, I don't know, I haven't had this conversation with many people, but it probably took me longer than most to get to that point. Hmm. And it's a, you know, that's, that's fine. You yeah. know, some people are quick learners in some things and, and not so quick learners in others. And, uh, it took me, it took me quite a while to, to get to that point. But then once I, I think once I, I, I did get there, I, I then started to see a pattern of, I'd follow a bad day with a good day Hmm. Hmm. where I think before when I would let a bad day affect me so much, I'd probably follow it up with another bad day. Hmm. So I think that was the positive that came out of it was I was probably able to bounce back a little better. Hmm. I don't know. I've never met someone. I don't, I don't think that it's like, man, I, I figured it out immediately. You know, like it takes takes time. (laughs) Yeah takes time man. i think we're all just figuring it out as we yeah. go along as well and i think we're we're always you know i'd say yeah maybe you meet a person that's lived on this planet for 80 or 90 years they're they're gonna have a lot of wisdom and a lot of knowledge and they're mm-hmm. gonna I think you know people that are on their deathbed aren't you know if i'm on my deathbed i'm not gonna worry about the 76 i shot at memorial one year <laughs> i'm gonna i'm gonna think about the things that really matter to my life, my mm-hmm. family, my relationships, my friends, you know, and that's, you know, and I think you just have to always remember that. Yeah. 
Definitely. Well, that's a, a great lead into one of the questions that I've had is if I wasn't planning to ask it today, but if you were on your deathbed, what would be something that you've learned in your life that you would want to pass on? Uh, I would say follow your dreams. I would say that's the biggest thing for me. I think we all have dreams as children and as kids. And I think um, either one society tells us that we can't dream that big or mm -hmm. influences in our lives just um, sort of take us off that path. So that's the one thing I would say is, is follow your dreams wholeheartedly and don't let anyone tell you that you can't. Because you think that it could be possibly attainable. Well, I think it could be attainable, but I also think that I think everyone on this planet is born with a, with a purpose. And I think we all, I think we're all given that purpose pretty young in life. And then it's, it's sort of up to us to, to follow that. Mm. Yeah. Interesting. So what would be your purpose? <laughs> um, I mean, I, to me, I feel like I've been given this talent of being a great golfer. Um, and I certainly don't want to waste it. So I think my purpose is making the most of the talent that I've been given, but also making the most of the platform that that talent has given me as well and try to be a good role model and try to speak up for the right thing and mm. um, try to encourage the next generation. To follow their dreams. To follow their dreams. Love that. Yeah. It's so true, man. Yeah. Everyone talks about like, oh, like, follow your dreams, but it's so truly hard because m like the money thing, right? Yeah. Like you yeah. gotta do what makes an income. But like, if you truly follow your dreams, like you could be great at, whatever it is, sculpting or like art or golf or anything. Yeah. Uh, anything. It could anything. be, it could be anything. Um, actually I re I got this really great, uh, book recommendation <clears throat> last week that I, I read over, I reread over the weekend called the alchemist. Oh man. Oh, I yeah. love that classic. Book. So wow. I think that's why it's in my head because <laughs> I just reread it and it's like, no, it's so like, that's it. It's so true. It is just like, it is so true. It's so true. And, and we don't realize we do it every single day. Yeah. Like right now I'm alchemizing this coconut water to become my body. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, we don't realize a little thing of how powerful we really are. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, and the, you know, and the little boy Santiago that's, you know, trying to find this treasure, he realizes that the, the treasure isn't actually the thing that he, you know, it's the journey, the journey, you know? Yeah. So, uh, it's a, it's a really cool book and I don't know, it's just, I think, but I think that one has always resonated with me because of the, the following of your dream. Mm -hmm. And because that's the dream that I've had. I mean, there's interviews of me when I'm seven years old saying I want to be the best golfer in the world and I want to win all the majors. <laughs> so like, you know, I have, I have lived my dream for a long time and it's, you know, again, going back to the very start of this podcast, I am grateful that I've been able to do that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Incredible. Yeah. I think, um, maybe to, to delve into that topic specifically though, with dreams, like you said, we all have dreams as a kid and whether it's to be an athlete of some sort or a great pianist or whatever it may be, uh, doubts start to come up. Mm -hmm. Right. And I'm yeah. sure you've experienced doubts throughout your life about your own talents or your, uh, yourself, your personality, whatever it may be. Uh, how have you been able to persevere through those doubts throughout your life? So, I would say anyone that knew, that knew me growing up said I, there was no doubt in my mind. I mean, <laughs> yes, there are times where you doubt yourself and you wonder if you're good enough and all that. But actually one of the quotes from the book that I, I wrote down straight away when I, when I read it was, if you, if you don't fear the unknown, the unknown will be kind to you. It's like, so to me, like it just resonated so much. Like, ah, oh, yeah, that's it. Wow. Like if you, if you don't fear the unknown, the unknown will be kind to you. Like that's that. such a great <sighs> affirmation. Yeah. Man, that's I, like right? what you always say I too. Always, yeah. For the last couple of years, my quote has been, 
in the unknown, there are endless possibilities. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's it. That is it. Love that. Yeah. Yeah. What, um, I guess to, to follow on Deg's question, um, how do you find whether it's in golf in relationships and working out, whatever it may be, how do you find comfort in the uncomfort? Like the times when it's yeah. hard. Um, I think it's, 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 it's either believing or convincing yourself that you're on the right path. That kind of place that you're, that you're like, there's a reason that you're going through this uncomfortable situation, whether it be mm. in the, in the gym, on the range, in a relationship, whatever it is. Like, I think there's always, there's a reason for everything. Mm -hmm. And as long as you believe that you're, you're, you're going through this and you're on the right path that will lead you to ultimately where you want to be. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that's how you find comfort in the, in the uncomfort. Yeah. It always comes back to that component of faith. Yeah. yeah. It's like faith in yourself, yeah, faith, faith in yeah. a higher power. Um, and faith can come from so many different places. You know, yeah. Just in it, that. It's fun. like, I've, I've heard the word faith a lot recently and I've all, I always associated faith with like God and religion, sure. but I think it, it has so many other meanings. Yeah. You know, that, and I think that's where, yeah, you, you have to, yeah, it's, it's, it's faith, it's belief, it's something that things are going to work out the way that they should, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. I, I think back to when we interviewed, you know, Mr. Nicholas and you asked him the question about spirituality and, you know, I had the same, you know, kind of figment in my head where I thought when I think spirituality or faith, first thing that comes in my head is God. And he talked about that aspect, but he brought it back to himself. Like he thought about being spiritual and, and having faith in him. Yeah. That was deep, man. Like yeah. that was really, that was really powerful. Yeah. And I know that resonates with, with you too, specifically. Yeah. I mean like the, I was raised Catholic and like believing that God is sitting in a cloud and with a gate and you go up and you're going to heaven or hell. And he said no or yes. And <laughs> like, it just never resonated with me. Um, so even the word God would like offend me as a, as a kid, cause it just didn't make sense. But now like that I've been on this journey, like I know that whatever you think God is, like it's within all of us, we're all made up of the same of stuff. The same stuff. Yeah. So it's like, you are God, you are like, it's all, we're all connected. So we can, we have that ability to tap into God. Yeah. Or, or whatever, yeah, or whatever, whatever that is. Yeah. What, yeah. Where we all originated from. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. I would be the same way. Like I, yeah, I was raised Catholic, but didn't what, like I was raised Catholic, but wasn't a Catholic. <laughs> and yeah, I got to the point where I was so disillusioned with religion and that, and I was like, no, I don't even want to hear it, but it's a, it can, it can be so many different things yep. I think is the, and it doesn't have to be that we all have to subscribe to the exact same belief system mm -hmm. and how we should live our lives, but just to having an open mind and having an open mind to what you're talking about, all of us coming from the same place and being interconnected on this earth. And mm -hmm. yeah, it's, yeah, for sure. Have you ever had something happened to you that was unbelievable like it can be on this topic it can be um, <laughs> that like you you were just like how did this happen good or bad um like i would say me sitting here in this house is unbelievable <laughs> um but i don't know i don't know if i can pick something off the top of my head um Okay, we can come back. Yeah, I come back to that. Give me, <laughs> give me, a, give me a bit. I don't know what the moment that's coming up in my head was when you won the U.S. Open at uh, in Maryland. What's the golf course? Congressional. Congressional. Yeah. And your dad coming on the green on Father's Day like that. Yeah. Just, I don't know. I have that image in my head. Maybe it's because I saw your dad earlier. Yeah, I mean that that's a that's a good one. Um, especially it's, after what happened at the right, Masters two right. two months previous. I think that's the other thing. It's it's like, I, I worked, so hard those two months on 
it had nothing to do with golf. It was to do with body language. It was to do to, with like mm -hmm. the energy I put out into the world. It, that like that that was all I was trying to do. Like from one one major to the next was I'm going to just be this like ray of sunshine and positivity. <laughs> wow. And um, I remember that whole week at Congressional. All like my goal for the week was to keep my eye line above the crowd because mm. my chest would be open. Mm. I would be, oh, that's I would, I would show positivity because I look back at the last round at Augusta. Oh yeah. Shoulders were slump, head was down. I know. Like just pictures. so negative. Yeah. So I was like, okay, I want to be, I want to do the, the complete opposite. Love that. Yeah. Wow. And again, what you put, what you put out into the world is what you get back. Exactly. So you say you work, you worked hard to do that. What, how did you do it? Did you do drills or? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, literally like every day, just, you know, shoulders back, eyes up, just really concentrating on if I, you know, every tournament in between, I can't remember where I played or like played wherever. And it was mm -hmm. like, okay, I need to practice. Mm -hmm. I need to practice my body language. I need to practice being more positive. That's amazing. Yeah. What else? Yeah. What are some other things? Was well, that when the the Rory walk really the began? Point. Yeah, the... I think I've always had that though. <laughs> <Let's try. laughs> Just my either this way or this way. Um, and then, I think the other things. And again, it comes back to remember that that Masters, and like it's so it's so hard to avoid those big white scoreboards. Mm. Like they're just everywhere and they're so... It's like a magnet. Yeah, it is. To your eyeballs. It's like, and I <laughs> actually had this chat with Bob Rutelli yesterday. He's like, just don't look at them. I'm like, it's not that easy. <laughs> yeah, <It's hard. laughs> uh, You need a ton of discipline. But um, I remember that Sunday, everyone was making a charge and like I, I was concentrating just as much on the leaderboard as I was on my own game. And it was just a huge reminder of, especially the one great thing in golf in our game is no one can really affect what you do. It's all up to you. It's mm -hmm. all up to, you can't, you know, when Roger, or when Roger Federer played Rafa Nadal, Rafa could just hit it high to Roger's backhand all the time. Mm -hmm. And then that, you know, that affected how Roger play. Like no one can do that with us in this game. Right. Yeah. You know, I, I struggle to hit it from left to right. No one's got to go and make me play left to right dog legs all day. Right. Right. So that, was it just a big reminder to me that like literally no one, nothing can affect the way you play the game if you don't want them to, mm. you know, you just have to have pretty strong will and, and have a, a pretty, a pretty clear mind on that and, and be disciplined enough to just stay within your own little, your own little bubble, your own little cocoon. Mm. Yeah. My mind's going to like now, like, how could actually someone affect another player just stupidly, you know, like before <laughs> yeah. the rules changed about a couple of years ago, you could be stepping in someone's line if you really wanted, but <laughs> yeah. Uh, does, but again, even if someone steps in your line, like the only thing that we can do is, is choose how we respond to that. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. There's a spike mark or, or whatever, but but I'm pretty sure we could still hold that putt. Yeah, I'm still gonna roll this yeah. furious. Yeah, ever. exactly. It's yeah. not, you know, the, the worst thing you could do is just get angry about it and start right. to, so like we always have the choice mm -hmm. to how we respond to, to things. Yeah, let it affect you or not. Yeah. What's your biggest accomplishment in your eyes? It doesn't have to be golf. Um, Certainly can be though. Yeah, I'd say, <laughs> I think one of the biggest compliments you give me at the start was like, I'm still very much like my dad mm. because I see how my dad is with people and I see mm. how much they enjoy his company and how much they like him. And if I'm, you know, if I've, you know, been through the journey that I've been through and I can still be like him, yeah, I think that's a pretty cool thing to be able to say. Yeah. Um, I think one thing like as it as it relates to my career that I've been really proud of is um of the I guess of the leadership role that I've played in the last few Ryder Cups for the European team um like that is something that I've been 
like leadership is something that I've been curious about and something that I've tried to tried to get better at, you know, whenever you get thrust into a situation where you're expected to be a leader, but you've never really experienced how to do that or, <laughs> or, or talk to people how to do that. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I've, I've, you know, I give Paul McGinley a lot of credit. He was the one that really started me on that journey in 2014 14, yeah. at Glen Eagles. And then, you know, sort of through those la- the, the last decade of um, sort of, and, and learning different styles of leadership and, and sort of what my style of leadership is and how I can bring people with me and, and try to lead by example in some way. And um, like, that's something that I'm, it's not, it's, it's, to me, it's important. It's a, it's a big achievement in my life. It, you know, it doesn't really matter to anyone else, but um, oh, that was the question. that's not the yeah. reason. Exactly. Yeah. So, but yeah, that's been a, that's been something that I'm, that I'm really proud of um, over the last, you know, 10 years of my career. Yeah. That's awesome. You, you can see it too. I mean, just, you know, I, I remember when you were quoted earlier in your career about the Ryder cup and it, it not being as important to you in comparison to the majors, but uh, I was just finishing the Netflix show, you know, a couple nights ago. And one of my favorite things they showed in that final episode was you in tears at 2021. It was yeah. like straights, yeah. you know? And so you've had a, a 180 in terms of the level of importance that that events had yeah. in your heart, it seems like. Yeah. I think, um, like we, we all like golf is such an individual game, but I think life is such a shared experience. And we talk, you know, we talk about this with, you know, going through things with friends and with family, uh, and the Ryder cup is such a shared experience Mm -hmm. and, you know, when you feel like you haven't given your best for the team and that team then loses, yeah, it, it hurts and it, um, yeah, you feel like you've let people down and that's, and that's tough. Mm -hmm. Um, and it, whistling straights in 21 I felt like I I let my team down I was supposed to be one of the guys that went out there and won points for the team and I didn't um but that gave me huge motivation to to go to Rome last year and to to be better and and to be you know to be a better version of myself there and um and you know thankfully I was I was able to summon whatever I needed to to win some points and um and help the team yeah when when you talk about leadership, obviously it's such a learning experience of of your own personal ways. Yeah. Um, say if someone was struggling and came to you or didn't come to you, and you saw that they needed advice or, or help, like what would be something that you would do? Yeah, it, it, I think as well. It um, different people respond to different things, mm-hmm. so um, I think you have to be really emotionally intelligent to mm-hmm. to to lead. Empathetic. uh, Empathetic, but um, lead like a diverse group of people. Mm -hmm. So um, the way I would maybe talk to Tommy Fleetwood would be different than the way I would talk to Nikolai Hogarth. Mm. Um, The way I would talk to, I don't need to lead John Ram, but like (laughs) the way I would speak to John Ram would be different to the way I speak to Bob McIntyre, for Mm -hmm. example. Um, And I think it is that, you know, b- being empathetic and, and trying to figure out what different people respond to in a positive way. Um, some, some people need a kick in the ass and some people need a hug. Mm-hmm. And I've always been someone that needs a hug. I don't, I, I don't do particularly well when, when I, I, I get motivated in a certain way. Like if the way to motivate me is to tell me I can't do something. Mm. That to me is how you motivate me. But if I'm really struggling, being harder and harder on me is going to just make me completely shut, shut off. That's so amazing that you hug. know that. Yeah. 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 But that's, again, that's self-reflection and mm-hmm. that's, um, but also these are the things I need to share with my team so that they, mm-hmm. so we can work well together mm-hmm. and we can get the best out of each other. So, and whether that's with my team myself or whether it's the week of a Ryder cup. Right. Yeah. So part of what makes the Ryder cup so special, um, in my eyes too, is, you know, money isn't involved in it. This is all for country. It's for pride. Uh, you're representing something that's bigger than you. I mean, when we had Luke on the show, I mean, you know, he was in tears talking about what this meant in his career. This was the shining moment of his career to put this team together. And he had a ton of doubt over his ability to lead a group of men. Mm -hmm. And, uh, 
I just I love LD, but uh, he's, yeah. he's he's amazing. He's unbelievable, and he and think of the circumstances that he took that job. As oh well. yeah, he wasn't supposed to get it. Henrik Stenson ended up going to live, so then then look got it in the end, and it was just a. But you know, I I said this, and I probably shouldn't have said it, but you know, Henrik Stenson going to live, I believe is is part of the reason why Europe won the Ryder Cup because I you know I look I don't know what Henrik's captaincy would have been like but Mm -hmm. I would be hard-pressed to think that it would have been any better than looks because look was just absolutely amazing and um like talk about a guy that instilled this like quiet steely confidence in a team Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know like he didn't need to do much you just had to look at him Mm -hmm that week and he looked great didn't look flustered he just put out this aura of i know what i'm doing that's mm-hmm. amazing and then when a team get that aura automatically they feel way more comfortable mm. and he he was he was unbelievable um yeah yeah he was yeah it's um i think it's hard to it's hard to put into words and describe just how how good he was and how much work he put into it. Yeah. And I think it's the, the preparation piece with Luke that probably made him stand apart from um, from everyone else. Yeah, just so passionate about it. Yeah, yeah. That's cool. I was going back to a note I got from him the other day where he said, we were talking about the last Netflix episode because I, I texted him like, dude, I'm in tears right now yeah. at the end of this final episode because of his interview on the 18th green. I had never, I'd never, I'd seen, never seen it until the Netflix. Dude. And I was, I was like, whoa, this is, I FaceTimed this is too him much crying. for me. <laughs> like, I was like, this is, cause you can feel it. Yeah. And he wrote me back this beautiful line. Don't try to get noticed, be remembered. And like, that's Luke Donald. Yeah. You know, wow. he is wow. so, he's cool. so, he's, you know, he's not a, he's very to himself. He's introverted, but he is a total, he models the way, mm-hmm. you know, and he's, uh, he's, what is it? The silver wolf for yeah, Grayson, exactly. yeah, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. James Bond. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Silver wolf. Yeah. It's true. Man. Yeah. Uh, yeah. He's, he's amazing. He, he did a incredible job. Yeah. yeah. He, he was, uh, we were at Ralph Lauren together and when he was there, I think he was number one in the world at that time. And over the last 10 years, like I've gotten to know him a lot more and he's opened up much more and become, at least with me, more joking and, and um, the uh, availability of, of advice and teaching. It's been really cool to see. And it's it's fun to see that, that role transition of the, the Ryder Cup and what he's done. Yeah. But I was going to ask you, um, with the leadership role, uh, transitioning into family life yeah um you mentioned in like 2020 or so you had the realization of my scores aren't me and with that was kind of around the time where you had your daughter yeah right poppy yeah poppy yeah. um tell us about yeah so i think that it's um yeah and i would say that um when i had that realization in 2019 we didn't know at that point that poppy was going to be born it was Mm. sort of later on in the year but i think that definitely prepared me for what was to come and and yeah look are there times still that i get pissed off i don't play well absolutely like that's just that's natural that's going to happen but um yeah poppy doesn't give a shit what i what i should (laughs) like so i uh so i went um I went last week to see Butch Harmon for a golf lesson. I, oh, wow. I've seen him over the year, like once every few years, I'll say, hey, Butch, can I just come see you? And mm-hmm. just, you can take a look and see what you think. Cool, yeah. So I'm leaving for the airport last Wednesday morning. And Poppy said to me, Dada, where are you going? And I said, I'm going to go for a golf lesson. I'll be back in a couple of days. And she goes, but Dada you already know how to play golf. <laughs> and I was like, that's probably the best piece of advice I've gotten in the last three yeah, years. Yeah. Right. So, um, but awesome. I, you know, so she, you know, I think kids are just, they, they bring a whole new, um, you know, people say perspective, but it's more so that I think when you start to spend time around young kids, you start to see the world through their eyes again. And it's so pure and it's so innocent. Mm-hmm. And um, you see all the good in the world. 
Mm. And so you true. and you get less cynical. Yeah. Which has been a great thing about having a, a young daughter. Yeah, that's yeah. amazing. So and she's 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 great. She is um she's got an attitude, but she's <laughs> she's good. Uh but yeah, it's it's been a yeah, it's it's obviously it's been a life changer and it definitely goes back to you know, when you're on your deathbed, what's what's important mm-hmm. and you know, to me making you know especially the life that poppy is going to live in her first few years is so much different than the life that i live right so trying to trying to make her realize how fortunate that she is and how you know how grateful she should be with everything that's in her life um and having her be a well-adjusted human being i think is going to be honestly one of if i if we can get it right like that'll probably be one of the biggest accomplishments of, of my life because, mm. um, it's such a, it's such a different world that, that she's going to grow up in. And, um, yeah, as long as she can be grateful for what she has and, um, and there's certain things you can do, right? I mean, we always talk about, you know, you don't want to, you also don't want to, you want to be able to give your kids what they need and, and try to give them a great life because of your success and you shouldn't punish them for that. You know, you shouldn't like make it hard for them, but Mm -hmm. you just want to make them realize that, um, not everyone's life is this way and just make her realize how fortunate that she is. Mm -hmm. So if I can, if I can do that, that, uh, that will hopefully be a job well done. <laughs> I'm sure you're doing it very well. We're trying, we're trying. <laughs> uh, is there anyone that you follow or any books that you read with, with parenting on how to be present or give advice or raise your child or schooling? Um, no, I think w- what, what we do is, um, ask friends that have already been through it. Mm-hmm. I, I think like reading books is good and, and, you know, getting little tidbits, especially for, but I think there's nothing better than talking to other parents that have, that have already been through what it's like to choose a certain school Mm -hmm. or, you know, you know, whatever my child's having these issues, what did, you know, what helped you, what did you do? So I think just that, you know, having a good support system around you. Um, and also like our parents, you know, my, my parents raised, you know, and I think we all, yeah, we all do the best that we can. Like I, I remember the morning before Poppy was born, YouTubing like how to <laughs> change a diaper yeah. and how to hold a baby mm-hmm. and how to, and all these things. I can't believe it took me until like the day of <laughs> the birth to to get to that point. But I think we're just we're all just trying to do the best that we can. Um, and that was goes back to I had breakfast with Bob Rutel yesterday morning, and and one of the things that he said to me is I talked about like trying really hard and he said no you don't he said you don't try your hardest you do your best and i think we're all just trying to do our best man yeah it's it reminds me of a quote that i heard one time that the grass doesn't try to grow just grows yeah like yeah it's an interesting quote but Mm -hmm. yeah it's felt very relevant to me it's like we're we're all the same like Just let it happen. If you truly want it, if you have that vision, if you have that dream in your head, yeah, then you know how to get there. I think and it innately. doesn't. It doesn't know why it's growing either, mm-hmm. right? So it's not trying to understand. Exactly. It's just, it's just growing. It's just, yeah, well, it's doing what it's supposed to do. Exactly. We talked about your highest moments in your career, um, and I always love learning what people look back on is their hardest time in their career because, yeah. you know, we could easily, you know, draw into a moment maybe that in golf history we could point to maybe it's, you know, the masters one year, a specific event, but to you, you know, what is the hardest thing you've had to go through in your life to this point? Um, hardest thing I've had to go through from a professional standpoint was probably, probably two things that stand out. Um, the first year that I was a pro, so I got my European tour card at the end of 07 and I had a terrible start to 08. And I remember I played this stretch in Asia. Like I'd played, it was like March, April time. 
it's like Malaysia, China, yep. Korea. And I think it was the third week in Korea and I'd missed my third cut in a row. And I remember going back to my hotel room, sitting on the end of the bed and feeling so far away from home and so lost and thinking to myself, is this, is this what professional golf is? Is mm. this like, is this it? Is this what I've signed up for <laughs> for the rest of my life? <laughs> um, and then decided to read the mini bar of every Pringle and <laughs> chocolate. And I'm very much an emotional eater. So, um, yeah, that's usually what I do when I feel bad. And then I missed the cut at, uh, the open in 2013 at Muirfield. And, uh, it was the first time I'd missed the cut at the open and I was going through a terrible time anyway, um, sort of on and off the golf course. And I had moved away from home like two years previous and was living, I sort of wasn't living anywhere. And I remember just longing for like, I just wanted to go home. I want to go see my friends. I want to go see my family. I wanted to, I felt like a bit of a nomad for two years. My game wasn't in great, in a great place. And I just, I just, it was the first time, it's probably the only time ever that I've really like longed to, for home and for mm. home comforts and for, so they're the, they're the two. And it all, it does all come back to sort of home in a way. Mm. Uh, but I think home, like home doesn't have to be a place. Home can be like a sort of a feeling and mm. the people that you surround yourself with. But mm. um, those are the two, I would say, I would say 2013 at, at Muirfield is the one that really stands out because um, I played with, I played with Phil Mickelson the first two days and he ended up going on to win the open that, mm. and he like the, the difference in our games at the time was just so huge. I just felt so lost. And um, yeah, that was a, that was probably the, the toughest time that, um, that I've been through, but you learn from it and these, you know, that's the thing. It's like, you know, I, I, I truly believe these things are meant to happen because mm -hmm. you can learn from them, you get better from them. And, you know, if it's all, if it's all part of the journey, then, you know, ultimately you should be grateful for them. What did you learn from them? So I would say specifically Muirfield was I needed, I needed to set up shops somewhere. I needed a home base. I needed, I needed somewhere to reset and recharge mm. and I can't just keep going and chasing my tail around the world and be on a plane 400 hours a year. So, um, yeah, I ended up like making a decision of like, I need to, I need to sort of settle, like settle down in terms of just, I need to, I need to put roots down somewhere. And that's when you moved here. And that's when I, that's when I decided that, um, that's, I, I already had a place here, but that's when I decided that I'm going to spend more time here. I'm going to try to really, you know, if I have a week off, I'm not going to go and travel somewhere, or do something. I'm going to go mm -hmm. home. I'm going to reset. I'm going to recharge. Um, and that was, that was really important. It's so important, man. Yeah. Like the, that sanctuary that you create for yourself is yep. like, man, I have our home in, in Costa Rica. It's like the moment I step foot there, it's like, oh. It's almost like, like your nervous weight. system yeah. resets, right? Exactly. Yeah. Like you, you create that feeling, whether it's the furniture, the, the, the memories, the, the smell, the space, the smell. Exactly. Yeah. 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 All of it. For sure. Yeah. It's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, you mentioned home, uh, as a feeling and, and you mentioned your friends who are some of your best friends. Why are they your best friends? Have they been your friends forever? Are they new friends? Yeah. So, um, most of my great friends are old friends, people that knew me before I was me, I guess, in <laughs> some way. Um, and yeah, those are the people that I, um, if I have problems, if I really want to speak to someone or the, you know, I, I, they're the ones that I feel know me the best. Mm -hmm. So, um, and like most of them are, we, some of us went to school together, but some of us just all met at Hollywood golf club. And I think that's why Hollywood golf clubs always had this, really important meaning to me is because um it's where I learned the game it's where I spent tons of time with my dad and my family but it's also where I met some of my like Harry Diamond who is 
my caddy now, but he's also my best friend. Mm. We were both the best man at each other's weddings. Wow. I met him on the putting green at Hollywood Golf Club when I was seven years old. No way. So, um, and then the same for like Mitchell Tweedy, Ricky McCormick, um, <laughs> all these these guys that I, I just grew up with. And they, they just, they know me better than anyone else. And yeah. they know, and, and they're not afraid to say what they should say mm-hmm. they're not afraid to say the hard thing i guess so and yeah um will i maybe not agree with them or may, will i be mad at them for a certain period of time yes but <laughs> they know they can say that because i know i'm not going to stay mad at them forever yeah. so it's nice and they're free. usually right that's the thing as well they're usually you know i think when people are like a step removed from some things especially if they know you very well they can almost see things a little more clearly clearly than you can than you can so um but yeah most yeah and then i look i have friends that i play on the tour with and everything but um yeah i would say for the most part um you know my real good friends all are are the ones that i grew up with yeah it's important to have that those people that can just tell you how it is yeah and Absolutely. you know that like if you go a couple months without talking to them and like you, you need some advice or yeah. vice versa. It's really important. Yeah. And, like, I'm, and I'm terrible at that too, because I'm very much like a out of sight, out of mind sort of person. So mm-hmm. it can be a couple of months. You're right. Yeah. So even like one, my friend Ricky, like he's a golf pro and I struggled the last round of Bay Hill this year. And he sent me this like really long message and he's like, look, I just, I like you, you need to do something. <laughs> no, you need to do, you need to get this out. You need to do that. Get on the track, man. Look for this number. Do this. Oh, cool. But it's all, you know, it's, and I, but I really appreciate it because it comes from a, a place of really caring. Mm. Um, and he's, you know, yeah, he's, he's not my golf coach, but he just, he felt like he could help in some way. And he, at least he felt comfortable enough to, to say what he wanted to say. Yeah. That must so, feel nice, right? Yeah, it does. Yeah. Sweet. Yeah. Are there any, do you have any mentors in your life? Or had or growing up? Um, do I have any mentors? Uh, Sounds like your dad, maybe. My my right? dad for sure. I think my 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 mom doesn't get a lot of airtime or a lot of credit, but mm-hmm. I would say my mom is very. Um, she's she's quiet. She very like almost polar opposite to my dad in terms of like doesn't say a whole lot reads the room you know great judge of character I think which I'm probably not very good at because it's hard to you know if I walk into a room full of people and everyone knows me and it's a it's hard to it's hard to be a good judge of character I think in in certain ways so Hmm. um I, I I I talk to my dad probably more than I talk to my mom, but like when it gets to like the really hard questions, my mom gets those. That's cool. (laughs) Yeah. So, but yeah, I I don't know if there's anyone else that I could say was like a, like a real mentor. Um, I maybe when I was coming up in the golf world, there was a couple of people um, that sort of showed me a showed me the ropes along the way, whether it was like Graham McDowell or Darren Clark, people that were from, where I was from that, Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I guess just showed me the ropes a little bit of how, what professional golf is and how it works and sort of putting an arm around me when I needed one. And so I, you know, there's, there's certainly, there's a lot of people in my life that I appreciate that have been there along the way for me at at certain points for sure. Mm. Do you have any goals in life outside of golf? Um, do I have any goals in life outside of golf? Yeah. I mean, I, there, yes, absolutely. Um, so whether it goes back to like investing or, or in business, Mm um, you know, there are certain things that I would like to achieve. And I think then being able to you know, I think this is really important and something that's been instilled in me from a very early age is you, you obviously can create this incredible platform and you can have a lot of success and you can make a lot of money, but what are you going to do with it? 
like mm -hmm. actually do with it mm -hmm. not buy another house or but actually put it to good use and put it to work so that other people can benefit from it um and like i've always said like i've been very very fortunate in my life that um there hasn't really been one event that has sort of put me on a path of what that looks like um but like as i said i you know at the start of this podcast like the, like the you know mental health or the prevalence of like autoimmunity these days and mm -hmm. just trying to educate people on food and <laughs> diet and holistic ways to look after themselves and look after the planet mm -hmm. like i think that is a that's not i don't think it's a it's a goal of mine right now but i think in the future that would be something that i really want to try to get into more what are some holistic ways that you've adopted in your life that has helped i mean sunlight first thing in the morning mm -hmm. and grinding and breathing and cold exposure heat exposure um trying to eat a very you know clean non-processed diet um like there's so i just think there's so many things in this world that can be solved so easily but there's just so many obstacles put in our way mm -hmm. to achieve them even you know to i mean in this country like to eat a healthy diet in this country is more expensive yeah right i mean it's insane, it's, it's, insane. Yeah. it's completely insane so like it's not like it's certainly not going to be solved by me and it's not going to be solved overnight but i think just adding my voice and some of my resources to that fight i think is a is something that would be a goal of mine in the future yeah it can have a huge effect for yeah. sure yeah um when we as athletes i think mention breathing and breath work like passively now because it's been kind of in our lives for a while and and educated on it but a lot of people when i bring up breath work they're like what do you mean like we're, we're just breathing now. Can you elaborate on what you do and what you mean by that? Yeah. So, um, like, as I said before, like breathing the right way, like mm -hmm. being taught to breathe through your diaphragm mm -hmm. and not through your chest and mm -hmm. like what that can do to like, just create tension. Like I, I, on, I had this rib issue for years and I am convinced it was because I didn't breathe properly. Very much mm -hmm. so. Yeah. Like, like you, we breathe. I don't know, like whatever, 20 times a minute. Mm -hmm. And you're doing that and your ribs are moving just a little bit every time. And I think because I I breathe so much through my mouth and that way mm -hmm. that like it 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 caused issues in my rib cage. And I, yeah. I truly believe that's the reason I had a rib problem. Mm -hmm. So learning to breathe, like it seems so like, what do you mean? Of course I can breathe, but, <laughs> but breathing the right way so that... Um, that then that creates a, it creates a knock on effect. Your nervous system is going to be more responsive and your, your, your way, it's way easier to filter. So another, I used to have allergies mm -hmm. since breathing through my nose and not through my mouth, my allergies have went away Amazing. because your nose can filter mm -hmm. all of those things, the pollen and, you know, microbes and whatever, and your mouth can't. Yeah. You know, just things like this that are so simple that um that people just don't realize. Yeah. It's and like, and you don't have you know, I think most people don't have access to the to the knowledge to to learn and to understand it. Yeah, but it's like bringing it back to the basics, you know? Like look at babies when they're laying down, what, what how are they breathing? Their stomach is going up and down. Their chest yep. is not going up yep. or their shoulders aren't going exactly. up. Exactly. Um, they so, can do a full squat. They can, yeah. you know, uh, you know, everything like yeah. it's just a lot of things in our life that, um, take us away from what we're naturally supposed to do. Exactly. Yeah. And that's what I've been all about is like finding the natural way again, yeah. because as you said and put it perfectly, it's like, it's all there. Like we, we make it more complicated because people want to make money Yeah, and yeah. With, you know, the pharmaceuticals and yeah. It's crazy. It's, there, there's so many ways to naturally help with um, a lot of different ailments, and I'm, I'm glad that you're, you're passionate about that. And yeah, big it's, time. 
Yeah, that's cool. Big time. So yeah, and there's been there's been people close to me that have been diagnosed with certain autoimmune diseases and um, went down the Western medicine rheumatology route and Mm -hmm. got nowhere and got put on medications Mm -hmm. and had these horrible side effects and then have went down this holistic path and got way better results. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What frustrates me about that is like people say, oh, you're, you're going in the alternative route. And I'm like, well, this is actually the original route. Yeah. This has been around yeah. thousands yeah. of years. Exactly. You know, what you're doing is yeah. a hundred years <laughs> yeah. and it's just, you have a trillion side effects. Yeah. You go have some herbs or like, you know, go on a fast for a yeah. little while and let your body heal itself, which it's meant to do. Yeah. Then exactly. Just try it. And people are like, oh, well, I don't believe diet. But you anything. know why? Going back to what I said, the right thing is usually the hard thing. Yeah. Mm really easy to take a pill mm-hmm. really hard not to eat for 72 hours correct good things take time yeah it's true man getting the lesson over here <laughs> <I'm enjoying this. laughs> i mean i'm you know morgan's become a really you know i knew morgan for years from being down here and but over the last couple of years he's become like a brother to me and a really dear friend and morgan was there for me in a in a really tough time in my life personally when I was in a long-term relationship and we were actually engaged and called things off. I remember talking to you about that. And, yeah. um, it's all right. We were both in the same boat there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's tough. I mean, and, and it's still a process. I mean, it's been a year and a half and I still have so much love for her and, and think about it all the time still. And I'm trying to move forward and, um, but it, it's, it is a getting through that tough thing and having faith, like we talked about earlier, that's what I still try to draw back to in my heart when I'm going through those challenging times too. Yeah. So. It, yeah. It's, it's believing that you're on the right path yeah. and yeah, being, yeah. And you know, not being fearful of the unknown, whatever that is. <laughs> yeah. There we go. Yeah. But Morgan's really introduced me to just an incredible amount of you know, new knowledge around holistic health that frankly, I just hadn't been introduced to before. Yeah. And it's changed my approach to my daily life around what I eat and how I exercise. And it's a noticeable difference, but it is yeah. certainly the harder path versus mm-hmm. taking an antidepressant or, uh, or an Advil. Yeah. Yeah. Or, yeah. 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 Well, it's not advertised. What do you see every day, all day? If you watch TV is advertisements for whatever you know (laughs) like seven thousand side effects and i i still go back to our our conversation with kelly gores too because i thought she gave such an unbelievable kind of definition around her perspective around holistic health versus western science her real definition was around chron any kind of chronic you know health issue of some sort the 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 root has to be some holistic method right you have to be going after a root that's that will take years of dedication to getting into that root, right? Versus obviously we've had incredible scientific advancements for broken bones and certain cancers and traumas that, uh, you know, Western science had incredible, uh, you know, modernizations in. But I I loved her kind of definitional difference between chronic and acute. And to me, that's kind of something that's grown in my belief system. Absolutely, yeah. In, In breath work, like, has there been any books? Like, I feel like there's this one book called Breed, breath by james nestor yeah i read it yeah. i read it at the i can i take that book takes me back to the pj championship at kiowa in 2021 oh wow yeah that's where i read it sweet <laughs> yeah it's funny you do remember where you read things or yeah. where you oh, experience yeah. things that are changing in your life and i love that book because it it it's his own personal journey too mm-hmm. of getting mm-hmm. to getting to the point of of where he's at to to write the book so yeah. um <clears throat> Yeah, that was really cool. There's a there was another one I read called "Shut Your Mouth to Save Your Life." Uh huh. Hmm. And that's you know it's really simple. Yeah. Especially for for me and and <laughs> and people that are mouth breathers. But um, yeah, it's a uh, yeah. There's there's tons you know the the breath work. Um, you know I think for for an athlete like cold exposure has really helped me. Mm. Um. In what way? just with i mean i think the mental side of things probably as well like doing something really hard at the start of your day yeah and and sort of trying to get comfortable in that uncomfortable (laughs) scenario um but it's definitely just helped you know sort of reduce inflammation in my body 
And then also it's definitely brought circulation back to my extremities. Like I used to, once it dropped below 50 degrees, like my fingertips would go numb, my hands would, you know, I, I, I just, my, my feet would like start to feel real achy. Mm-hmm. And like, I, I don't really notice any of those problems anymore. Oh, awesome. Yeah. Mm. So that's something that's been, um, a nice plus as well. That's yeah. cool. Yeah. Yeah. You learn so much from the hardest times in your life. Like, yeah. I, I mean, I just, you know, brought up my personal story there and it's like you, I've grown up so much from these incredibly hard times or at these low points and realize kind of that faith in yourself and that you, you are, you know, going through life and learning. And as long as you keep growing and you know taking these different events in your life on the chin and learning how to better yourself from them, they can really, you know, help you. But I think before we start to wrap this up, I'd love to ask you a couple like golf specific questions. Sure. Um, Absolutely. That are kind of fun. Um, if you are, you know, if you play so many pro-ams with, you know, guys that are anywhere from scratch golfers to absolute hacks, right? I can't imagine some of the pairings you get at times. <laughs> but what are, what are some ways that you think golfers can really easily improve, you know, their, their game, whether they're 15, trying to get to a 10 and kind of keep going down from there? like this is a really boring answer but like just playing within yourself like even i have to follow that advice sometimes like i'll <laughs> I'll hit it in the trees be like oh no i can do this and then harry will be like no just chip it out but um <laughs> yeah i think uh playing within yourself not taking on too much um really getting to know your tendencies. Mm. Do you miss it right? Do you miss it left? Do you usually come up short? Do you usually go long? Those sorts of things. And sort of playing away from the weakest parts of your game, mm. I think is a, mm. is a pretty easy way to take strokes off your handicap and, and improve. But I, you know, that's, that's not just amateurs, that's everyone, mm. you know, I think, but it takes discipline and it's, and it's hard. And I, it's something that I have to constantly remind myself of. Yeah, you know, just play, play within yourself. Don't take on too much. You don't have to be perfect to play good golf. Yeah, you know, that's true. When you're when you're in you know these largest moments where it's the back nine of a major, whatever it is, what are the things that are going through your head in those moments? Because we see athletes on the outside, and you're so look calm and collected. And but I mean, is it just a storm that's going on that you have to try to find ways to narrow your focus? Yeah, there's a lot of. Um, I think there's a lot of like self-talk and it's more, it's like, it's like a, it's like you're trying to bat all these other thoughts away and be like, no, focus on what you're, you know, no, focus on what you're doing, focus Mm -hmm. on what you're doing. Like I I remember, um, had a two shot lead playing the last at, uh, at the open championship in Liverpool in 2014. Mm -hmm. And I was in a, I was in a, greenside bunker and I just needed to chunk it out in two putt and I would win or three putt even and I would win um but I couldn't I I had to keep reminding myself it's not over it's not over it's not over it's not over so it's like no matter where you are it's always like just trying to focus on the next shot the present moment it's so cliche but it's so it's so important in those moments to just really focus in on the next thing, mm. whatever the next thing is. Mm. And that's the most, that's the most important. I mean, this present moment is right now the most important part of our day because the past is the past and we don't really know what's going to happen in the future. So yeah. all we can do is focus on, on the here and the now. Mm. And that, but I, I think that's a constant, like having to remind yourself of that as you're going through those, those situations on like a back nine or, um, you know, Sunday singles match at a Ryder Cup or, or whatever it is. Yeah. Are there any um, phrases or mantras per se that you would repeat to yourself in certain times? Like, like I'm the best or like I'm Rory fucking McIlroy. Yeah, <laughs> nice. Yeah. One of my I coaches probably sh- I probably should. I probably <laughs> should say that more. Um, the one, one of the things that I love um, is um, like focusing on the process over the prize. So I would say to myself a lot, process over prize, process over prize, process mm-hmm. over prize, just to take myself away from the outcome. Like that's why I've always liked a swing thought or a swing feeling because it takes your mind away from the outcome of what you're trying to do. Mm. 
So, um, and like, I, I know for myself more, so I don't know about other people, but, um, I can get, I can get real caught up in the outcome and, and I just really need to remind myself that the outcome will ultimately happen if you just focus on the process. Take care of itself. Yeah. 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 Is there one swing thought that you've had recurring over the years or is it always kind of changing? It's always changing. And I think that like, we'll all know this, a swing thought you, that you had a few months ago is, is great, but then it's not going to work. Like I've, like, I think about swing thoughts that I had, you know, in that summer of 2014, when I won two majors and a world golf championship in between. And like, I try to go back to it. I was like, <laughs> why, why can't no, they not work? there. Yeah. Why can't they <laughs> work? Not there the anymore. Yeah. So uh, it's, that. it's, it's constantly like trying to, it's trying to get the club in the same position, but just in a different way or a different <laughs> way of thinking about it. So, um, the, what there's one, if I'm struggling, I usually like my tendency is to get the club to drop behind me and underneath, and then I chase it a little bit with my right hand. So one of the things I guess that has been like a really good fix for me over the years is I try to keep like a lot of strength in the club face. And then that just forces me to like rotate hard to get out of the way and like stabilize that club face going through. So like, I always think about like strong, strong face cuts because that always gets me back to neutral. Mm. That's always been like a good swing, like a drill or a, a, a swing thought to have. And do you do that mm. with like grip pressure or like what? what's the... Um, I almost will do it with like hand position. Mm -hmm. So I'll, I'll try to have like a little forward press at a dress to mm -hmm. feel like strength in the club face. And then just like try and keep that strength on the way back and just rotate through. Get and it back there. Just get it back there. Yeah. Yeah. Sweet. Yeah. So, and, and I don't know if this is much of a known thing or not, but I mean, you have an insane work ethic, like just being around you down here. I mean, the amount of time you spend practicing the game of golf and different golfers are different. Some guys play less, some guys play a ton of golf, don't practice as much, Yeah. but what's an average day look like in your life when you're here on an off week preparing for, we've got the masters in two weeks. So, yeah. Um, so today um, I was in the gym at 7 a.m. I was out the door. Um, or no, I, I'll go yesterday because that was probably a, sort of more of a, a better day. I had uh, 6 a.m. gym, 8 a.m. breakfast with Bob Rutella. I practiced from 9.30 to 12.00. 12. Uh, I had a 12.30 to 2.30 meeting with a private equity company. <laughs> uh, I then went back to the course and practiced again from 3 to 5. Uh, got home, jumped in the cold plunge, had dinner, and went to bed. It's a nice day. That's a, that was basically like a, a day. And um, some days will look different. Some days I'll have more time and I'll be able to maybe spend a little time with Poppy or bring her to school one day or whatever it is. But, um, most days I'm up between five thirty and six and I'm usually try to get the, the gym stuff or whatever out of the way early. Uh, and then that frees up my day to, to practice, to play, to, you know, do podcasts, hop on zoom calls, whatever, <laughs> whatever it is. Um, so mm -hmm. it, it, but I, I, it fills up quick, but I, Again, it's that work ethic thing and going back to my parents. I like being busy. Mm -hmm. It just, it, you know, I, I can, I can sit and do nothing and, and be idle. Um, but for the most part, my days look pretty, pretty jam packed. Very cool. Yeah. Well, Camilla was telling us that he was going up. You guys are going to play Augusta. For yeah. I missed a call week, from him, so. um, on the way here. So yeah, we're going to go up and play. We're going to fly up Monday, play Augusta. Cool stay that night, play Tuesday morning, and then we'll head to um, San Antonio. We're both playing the, the Valero over there nice. before going back and playing the Masters. So I'm pumped for Camilo as well. It's his first time back at Augusta in yeah. a long time. Yeah. So. And having Mateo with him. Yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah. yeah, it's, yeah. yeah. Geez, talk about resilience and yeah. just an unbelievable perspective on life. Mm -hmm. Just crazy what that family has been through and like they're an inspiration to all of us. Amen. Really cool. That's for sure. Amen.
Yeah. Well, I think it comes to our final question. Oh, uh, that is uh, just the the title of our podcast, and I can fly, and the inspiration behind it is the feeling of flying. Yeah. Whether it's like for us being pilots, or is there a time in your life where you were like, I could feel like I could fly right now. Whether it's like. I just want an event. I had yeah. a baby. <laughs> and, what's yeah. that, and what's that feeling mean to you? When you yeah. hear the words, I can fly, what does that mean to you? So I would say, yeah, I, I you know, I, I don't know if this is probably not a great thing, um, but I always go back to that summer of 2014 and think about like what I achieved in that summer. Um, and yeah, after the PJ championship, like I felt like invincible, <laughs> like I'm never going to lose a golf tournament again in my life. That's how I felt on that Sunday night. It's amazing. Um, so that was probably, you know, when I really felt like I could fly, but I think the term or the phrase is feeling like nothing's going to stop you. Mm. Right? I think when you say I can fly, it's like, no, nothing is going to get in my way of, of me achieving what I want to achieve. That's that's what I think I can fly means. I love that. I yeah. love it. Yeah, incredible. I can't wait to watch you uh, in a couple of weeks. Thank you. Given that 2011 swagger, I love that when you're talking about those couple months between the Masters yeah. and and the U.S. Open and just focusing on your posture and that mm. you know your your body language. That's killer. So yeah, you put positivity into the world and hopefully that's what it gives you back. Exactly. Love it, man. Awesome, man. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Thank really you. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, this yeah, was awesome. Cool. Thank you.